just to look at an example of how uh, renewable energy is becoming a larger and larger part of the portfolio of total energy production. California is again a, a very good example and we have learned about California effect where other states begin to follow the example of California. So here is uh, the uh, histogram of the annual renewable percentage estimates uh, of California's power uh, portfolio. Uh, started in 2012 uh, significantly uh, at 22 percent and ha is now uh, was up at 34 percent by 2018 and is projected to grow to 60% by 2030. Remember that the uh, whole course is based on Uni University of California system wanting to go carbon neutral by 2025. So obviously California system which hosts the University of California system must uh, grow as well to uh, have more and more renewable percentage uh, as its total uh, energy uh, production. Could be imported from outside the state or could be generated within the state. As we saw it has um, uh, restrictions on uh, renewables, be Im the import of energy as well. Okay, renewable uh, sources have a, uh, every power generation system has what is called capacity factor where it is the uh, actual uh, power generation in terms of let's say megawatts as opposed to the total capacity or the nameplate ability it has to produce um, power. So it's the installed capacity versus actual production. So renewable ro resources also have a low capacity factor defined as the percentage output divided by maximum or nameplate output uh, integrated over a month or a year or some dis dis decided uh, period of time. So nuclear obviously cannot be easily turned on or off uh, or cannot be turned off easily once it's turned on. So that has a very high capacity factor of 93.5. Natural gas drops to 56.8. Coal uh, low as well. Hydropower, wind and solar. Okay so you can see that the renewables here drop uh, relatively low which adds to the intermittency or the lack of ability to supply energy when the demand suddenly jumps up uh, because of weather change or because people are plugging in their electric vehicles and so on. I think in 2019, right, the uh, three people, that three scientists that won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, was for rechargeable batteries. I think this uh, Professor John B. Goodenough from uh, UT Austin is close to 98 years old if I remember right and he still comes to the lab every day. He said the Nobel Prize makes no difference. I, I just keep working because that's what I want to do. Okay, All right, so the lithium-ion battery, everybody's heard of the lithium battery now and there are various issues of not being able to put them in your check-in luggage because there was I think a fire uh, hazard and so on and so forth for the battery packs nonetheless. They, they work in a very simple way where there is an electrolyte which is common for all battery technologies. <coughs> has a cathode and an anode obviously to make electricity flow and there is lithium oxide of some sort stored in uh, uh, the cathode and the anode is typically made of some uh, carbon material. Uh, so the uh, charged uh, battery uh, puts the positively charged lithium uh, uh, at the ions at the cathode and the electrons cannot cross the electrolyte. Only uh, lithium is allowed to go through. So they have to find another pathway which is obviously provided when we uh, connect something. So that produces a uh, energy power source, energy source obviously. So you can uh, connect it to a car like Tesla, uh, light bulbs, uh, laptops uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, this is the general uh, technology. So we will see later on that the 
uh, electrons that flow, which is essentially the electricity that uh, drives uh, power, uh, enter the cathode and they still have enough energy to combine uh, when you do fuel cells uh, to combine with uh, air and produce water and nitrogen compounds. Okay. In the future, energy storage technologies may be required in addition to electric batteries. So these are driven, driving little utilities of cameras, laptops, cars. Um, uh, they have to absorb the enormous amount of otherwise curtailed energy. Curtailed energy is when you uh, uh, ramp down production because the load is low so they are not operating at full capacity at all so the capacity factor is reduced provide the ramp rates how quickly you can ramp up the energy supply uh, the, the rate at which energy generation resource responds to load change required for both the absorption and reuse of energy for example if the temperature spike because of a heat wave suddenly everybody may turn on their air conditioning or fans which is going to suddenly put a lot of demand on the grid so how quickly can you ramp up the uh, resource production store the energy for months uh, to go from one season to another uh, and count, uh, counter the self-discharge associated with electric batteries so if you leave a car that's running on batteries sitting around then obviously it's going to discharge uh, and then you have to recharge again when you want to drive away. So it's not like a fossil fuel car where you get in, you turn on the engine and boom, you can go. Of course, even those, the engines can get cold and the batteries can discharge. So to drive the combustion when you turn on the engine, you still need a battery. Uh, those can also be discharged. So the fossil fuel cars also have to be maintained um, in the, in a sense you cannot let it sit there for a year and then expect it to crank up um, when you uh, put the key in and turn on the engine okay <clears throat> so th those are the few uh, points that are slightly disconnected but we will see uh, how they connect as we go forward <clears throat>